Welcome to today's session with Inspired Media and in, with association with PIN. My name is John Cosson and I'll be moderating today's session, but I, I'm hoping it will be very interactive and uh, we'll all get a, um, uh, a good opportunity to, to talk about this, uh, the topics and subjects, etc. that will be interested. Um, I'm head of IT and CISO at JM Finn. We're a wealth manager based in the city with offices all over the country. Um, uh, my primary role as, uh, as head of IT and uh, as a CISO, I wear two hats, um, service delivery and, uh, and head of the IT department, and also security as well in charge of cybersecurity and, and the security infrastructure of our organization. I've been in the industry for 35 years, uh, and I feel all, every one of those at the moment. Um, and um, I've been in my current position in senior management for about 26 years and, and 21 of those years being at my current role at JM Finn. So I've been there a very long time. Um, I'm going to be welcoming um, a small group today, and I'm going to firstly introduce you over, and I'll, I'll get this right, is it Sav, Lav, um, from ING Bank, who um, is, hi, Sav, who's going to just uh, talk a little bit about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Hi guys, I'm I'm Slavik Sushinsky. I'm a CIO for ING Polar uh, and uh, that's that's a fairly new assignment uh, over the last eighteen months. Um, before I was the uh, was responsible for the corporate technology at JP Morgan, and also was finding one of the global ser shared services, roughly for you know a couple of hundreds of people. And then before that, I was the one of the uh, regional CTOs for uh, for City, so with responsibility for fifty four markets uh, across Europe, Asia, Africa, Middle East, and a couple of other interesting locations. So that's me. Looking forward for the discussion. Thank you. Uh, quite a lot of experience there, and I'm sure we'll leverage a lot of that during the conversation. Thank you for that, Slav. Um, and Duncan, Duncan Woodhouse from LNG and LMV. Um, Duncan, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, um, hard hard act to follow that. Um, I've I've only been doing it about uh, twenty something years, so um, you know there's some experience there. Information security and uh, and on IT security, you know, joint roles over the years. Uh, Head of information security at Legal and General uh, in our little world. We we are, as you say, also joining the LV Geek world and ultimately owned by Allianz. So. Yeah, it's, um, you know, when we're talking about customer experience and digital onboarding and identities, uh, very interesting times, you know, financial services, what businesses want to achieve, how we get, how you do that with, you know, three three business entities, what does a customer experience look like, all, all of that good stuff, really. I think you're going to have a, um, it's going to be a very interesting conversation. We're it, have a lot of, uh... We've only done 10 months of it so far, and I can tell you it's very interesting so far, yes. <laughs> You uh, you still based in uh, the Coleman Street area, LNG? We so legal and general head office is yes. Um, we've got a sort of um, we've got head uh, obviously Alliance is based in Guildford, our LV is based in Bournemouth. Oh. So we've got we've got three head, head three head offices or four technically. There you go. We're so, right next uh, to you in Coleman Street. That's where I know you're building. Yeah, right yeah, door. it's 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 a very nice it's a very nice bit of the world. Yeah. Well, it will be when we go back. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it was a nice bit of the world. It's probably still there, right? But yeah, it's a nice pub around the corner as well. But yeah, yeah there, there are. Well, there, well, there yeah. hopefully it'll still be there. Um, yeah. I'm going to pass you over now to our sponsors today for Ping Identity and uh, the CTO, uh, Rob Otto. Do you want to introduce yourself, Rob? Hello, John. Yeah, thank you so much. So, yeah, Rob Otto, uh, Emir Field CTO at um, at Ping Identity. So, yeah, I've been in this industry a, a long time as well, probably not as not as long as some of you, but um, you know, probably a good uh, sort of 20 years or so myself as well, um, doing various things in and around, um, you know, I guess starting off really with uh, e-commerce and doing doing business via the internet, right? Um, and of course, identity and access management has always been a, a really key enabler, a key component of that. Um, and so, yes, in, in various guises as, you know, sort of um, consultant and sort of, you know, product leader and, and now more recently in a, in a, a field CTO role um, with, uh, with Ping Identity. I've been in and around identity and access management for a long time, um, doing different things, obviously uh, spending a fair bit of time in the internal workforce uh, sort of identity governance type of space as well. Um, understanding some of the uh, some of the, the complexities, I guess, around the you know what sort of single sign-on and secure access looks like from from a workforce point of view. 
Um, but I would say more recently, probably the last sort of two or three years, um, my focus has been a lot more on the, uh, the customer IAM or the consumer focus piece. Um, and I think the, uh, you know, the thing that I'm really excited about and, and why it's really good to be part of this panel today is um, specifically around the impact on customer experience, how we can use digital identity to enable uh, transformation and ultimately to, you know, to make things better for the, uh, for the consumers for our customers who who rely on the services that we provide. So um, yeah, again, a very big welcome to uh, to all the other panelists. Um, big thank you to yourself as well, John, for uh, hosting and moderating, and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, um, uh, Rob. Well, just before we start, I'll just um, uh, want to state that you can use the questions panel. Please feel free to ask questions. Um, they will come through to me, and I can then ask the, pa the, the panel. So uh, please, uh, as we go through this, I'm sure there'll be lots of interesting questions and we'll try to um, allocate some time at the end to, to discuss. So question, I'm going to start off with um, uh, the first question and, and for a discussion. Enterprises can have many different business units. Obviously, that's evident from, from the companies you work with. Uh, and even external apps like credit card loyalty programs, etc. Is customer access to these programs somewhat disjointed and i'll give you a couple of examples potentially through registration authentication or the actual look and feel does it feel completely different based on the different apps and i'm going to come into you first with this duncan because uh, you're going through a merger at the moment i'm sure this is going to be a real challenge to you and how yep. you combine these technologies. So yep. do you mind uh, starting first with this? That, that's absolutely fine. I can see you guys also nodding your head. Uh, yes, I, let, you know, let's let's face the elephant in the room. I think um, a lot of the of what we do in our business is um, is increasingly about, you know, uh, maybe it's a, a bit of an old fashioned term, but a sort of identity and access management, um, you know, both inside the business and outside the business. Um, I've, I've, you know, without giving too much away, uh, what can I see? I can see that we've got lots of applications, lots of different platforms that we sit on. Um, the businesses all have different ways in which they they reach or give identities to people. Um, yes, you know, um, I hate to say it, it is somewhat disjointed. There's no, you know, there's no sort of overarching uh, way in which you have an identity, um, which again, you know, we, we know is quite important it just just gdpr will tell you you know data portability how does how does somebody take one application and and when they say duncan i need my information in this lovely wizzy new alliance app and i want it tomorrow how do you actually make it work in the background if if really you're a you're in you're, you're in lng or a part of previously of lng it's got to go to lv and it's got to go to alliance and it's got to be available you know the answer is we'll get there eventually but you're not going to see it tomorrow and and how does that the big challenge is how does a customer have an identity that travels with them uh, such that the customer experience means that they can seamlessly without friction you know i use this term all the time and um you know what's the experience for the customer that the experience for the customer now and particularly you know covid tells us that we're at home um we're probably getting a bit frustrated sometimes as staff members because we can't quite do everything we need to do well customers you know, they're looking at this as here's a great opportunity. I want to be able to access these multiple applications from wherever I or from wherever I work. You know, and I can't say that we're there. Um, I'm not sure necessarily many people can. The challenge is always going to be, um, you know, within one business, we're certainly making frictionless a bit more of an option. You know, we're, we're putting things in, and that's more like sort of uh, simple chatbots to direct people to say here's some common questions but in terms of porting porting them from one application to another that that's quite difficult and you know we don't have that yet and as you say we have multiple sort of parts of the business so so a big challenge but um duncan just to, to add to that i mean obviously i can understand that the challenge but do you think this this potentially a disjointed experience is actually causing any issues in in brand damage yep. or, yep. or yep. even uh, revenue loss yeah, it, it is. I mean, you know, if, if we accept that people want um, a seamless, frictionless approach to applications, you know, in many respects, they don't they don't worry whether it's energy branded, it's branded, LV branded. They they need to know um, that they can get 
you know, quick, easy, safe access to those applications. If you're putting too many barriers in the way of somebody setting up those accounts, um, you know, making it difficult for people, then then obviously, you know, they're likely to look for alternatives which are easier to use. So it does it does create friction. Yes. I think there's, uh, and we can talk about this a bit later, I think there's challenges around compliance as well because you need sometimes that that almost friction because it's a requirement of the regulator. Um, and we can, we, we, we'll mention that, we'll, we'll move on to that. Slav, uh, can, uh, have you got your experience on this and do you think that that resonates with you um, regarding yeah, the disjointed approach? Absolutely, yes. I mean, it's a very good question because uh, you know, in the, today's world, we, the, the, the financial market is pretty much heavily regulated, like heavily, heavily, it was never done before like that, right? And obviously in many cases, uh, you actually, when you're doing the uh, registration of the customer, basically you are not allowed in many cases actually to offer one unified experience because of different nature of the business. So just example, if you are setting up a consumer customer, for example, it's hard to imagine that you will be setting up at the same time of his brokerage account because he doesn't simply have a history with you with the bank. So it's hard to offer him a brokerage account. So it's obviously it's disjoint, right? But what we're trying to do is obviously to make sure that once, uh, you know, once some history is there, uh, then we actively approaching the customers and giving them access to, you know, to investment platform or to the brokerage uh, house or, you know, custody, depends what, what, what other needs are. And then obviously later on during the authentication, you see as one single sign-on, um, which obviously customers love it. Um, uh, but registration is really hard to do purely because of, uh, you know, of, of legal requirements. But the focus on during the registration is definitely, you know, the, the customer experience and making sure that uh, this, this is happening regardless of the, of the, of the channel. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, we are able to provide the 360 view on the customer to identify those needs. Um, yeah, and, uh, and the proactive engagement with the customer is, is definitely uh, 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 something that customers, uh, you know, see as the, as the strong value um, and is happening. And that's the way you can actually compensate that, you know, those, those first experience where you want to be... Uh, you know, set it up with all sorts of services is pretty much, you know, in many cases not, uh, not not possible. When it's coming to you know to the um, potential lost revenues, you know, um, ING is very very much a digital bank. Um, we, we, I, think, I hope we are fairly known on the market with, uh, with with our innovation base and introducing any products to uh, to customers. But the fact is that, like you know, one one or one delighted customer will bring two new customers. One dissatisfied customer will take ten customers, right? So the customer experience and managing that experience and making sure that we understand the customer needs and to some extent predict those uh, needs is 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 that's that's what that's where the game is now, right? And uh, and that's that's the key. Do you think? I don't. Um, like, I don't no, sorry, like, Sorry, so, so I don't really see like a direct impact on the revenues. That's really hard to measure from that perspective. But we have strong, like we feel it might be a problem, but we have enough compensating controls to make sure that, you know, the, the, the customers like us and uh, and uh, and we working really hard to make sure that it's happening. So, yeah. It, it's, I'm going to bring you in a minute, Rob, but um, I'm just going to touch on the compliance side because the, it, certainly in the UK, there's been a, a slightly lighter hand during COVID. And I think uh, many of our um, customers and, and clients, et cetera, um, uh, potentially experienced this and they experienced the, the some, to a certain degree, the, um, the seamless side where you can take photocopies with a phone, et cetera, and, and bypass some of the rules, but they may come back again once COVID, once the pandemic is over. Do you think we should learn from this and, and hopefully move forward and actually say, look, this is work, this hasn't, and how can we build this in to um, our processes and our, and, our, and our products that would actually help? And this would, would help during re registration, authentication, and, uh, and look for the benefits out of this terrible pandemic that actually we can look at some benefits at the end of it. I'm going to go back to you on that, Duncan, if I may. 
yes i think we do i mean i'm going to use that that horrible term that people hear a lot but disruptors you know the, the sort of west coast american sort of approach and um you know alliance has got it on the website um you know think thinking like an entrepreneur thinking like a disruptor within your own business you know i think the, the worst thing any business can do regardless of size and historic success is you sit down and say we we're not going to adapt to, to what the market is asking us to do um i think people do you, you know we look at it inside the business outside the business you're entirely right where we've and and compliance doesn't doesn't always mean uh, difficult um you know where where sort of security is more transparent to the user often it often it means that it's a little bit of a better experience but we know that we can rely on slightly different technologies to enable the same security I mean, you know, I'm old enough to remember when when really I worked in security a while, you know, 20 years ago, we might have been seen as a cost center. We may have been seen as somebody that was a blocker to the business. You know, it's very crucial for people now in information security, IT security to enable the business to have the same security. But think about the customer first in this process. How do the how do we identify? How do we authenticate? you know and take airbnb that's a really good example um they didn't you know uh, they were criticized for not having an, you know enough complexity or in, in in terms of how they identify people they moved to a different method as you say you can now you can now take photos you can now identify same with uber so even the disruptors are learning how to be better compliant but also making the whole process easier to identify and authenticate people so i think i think a lot of businesses will as you say john learn from the covid side as to how how to make it um just as secure but but a nicer process at the end of it for the customer i think many organizations see um still see um security as, as an overhead and, and something yeah that, that, they absolutely do and i think um the challenge there is actually whilst we do inverted commas i work for an american business um they like the phrase lights on you know we, we're not um you know, there's there's lots of my colleagues who do some really fantastic stuff with flashy lights and super duper new technology. Uh, that's no good if it if it's going to ruin your business. So you know, we we are often the men and women in the background that are enabling people to be sensible risk takers. We're, we're still allowing the business to take risk, but it but they're well informed as to what they are. I agree, and I think um, some businesses are now realising that it's a real business enabler where you can um, develop applications that are secure. And that your clients see you as oh well, they produce these secure applications. I trust them because yeah. we're seeing we can come on to this a little bit later, but I think that's an enabler. Rob, I'm gonna bring you in now for the first uh, time in this conversation. Um, what do you think what's been said so far and 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 what do you believe um from, from what you've heard? Um yeah, John. So, I mean, a couple of really interesting themes that have that have come through here. Um, you know, we obviously work with uh, with a number of organizations that are um, in, in in kind of different uh, different stages on on this journey towards um, customer identity and access management, or towards a, a platform for customer identity and access management that can be leveraged across their business, or across in some cases the multiple businesses that they that they operate under under a single umbrella. Um, you know, when we sort of look back to how identity and access management has traditionally been implemented uh, within within the workforce. Um, you know, we've accepted that there are a number of different applications, a number of different things that individuals need to access. And, and there's an expectation that each time you access one of those things, you will go through some form of authentication process. Single sign-on came into the picture so that, you know, you hopefully don't have to be typing in a username or password each time. Uh, but, but there's still this expectation that you will sort of log into each of these things. When you turn that around and you look at the way your customers interact, your customers don't expect you to be exposing a number of different applications and different experiences to them. They're expecting there to be one experience. That experience is not necessarily just what they what they see when they interact with you via a website, for instance. It's the experience across every channel that they use. So your website, a mobile app, any chatbots that you have, a call center, and possibly even in-person interactions through through a branch network or, or something like that. Now, this is the, the expectation that individuals have that that you're actually going to know them um, as them when you when they interact with you across all of those different channels, um, and, and they sort of expect that you know whatever digital identity you establish for them is actually going to be an, an enabler for for all of those things. Now the technologies and the standards exist today 
to enable uh, a platform to do those kind of things. But the question we have to ask is then why, you know, why are we not really seeing um, the, the sort of the broad adoption or why is it more difficult to, to adopt this kind of thing um, within an organization? I think that the, the, the sort of some of the difficulties or some of the challenges that, that come into this is that, and with particular focus on the consumer, on the customer space, is that identity services for customers need to be intrinsically tied into the journeys that those customers are, are undertaking. Uh, identifying a, a customer, registering that customer, doing something like a multi-factor authentication step up or a strong authentication. These should be things that are naturally consumed and naturally uh, embedded into the customer platforms that, that they're already using. They shouldn't be exposed to that friction where it's like, well, okay, I was doing something, but now all of a sudden there's a, an identity and access management thing that is popping up and is asking me to do something and that's interrupting what I'm doing and that's, and that's causing the friction. But a big part of enabling all of this is that those services that we deliver as part of a customer identity and access management platform have to be developer friendly. They have to be there as a platform that the various different developers developer organizations within a company can start to use, can figure out how to consume and can figure out how to embed into the customer experiences that, that they are building. Um, ultimately, to me, this is the, um, you know, this is the thing that that's, that's going to, um, you know, that's going to make these kinds of seamless identity uh, experiences uh, more uh, easier to do. And ultimately, that's the thing. I mean, Duncan, to come back to your point, it's been probably a rather circuitous path to get back to your point. But that's when we start to see digital identity as an enabler that enables us to to do innovative innovative things from a from a business and from a customer experience point of view. I think that's really interesting. I mean, uh, building on that, um, uh, Rob, as well, um, and and bearing in mind that we have regulations, we have requirements, and. In, you know, they certainly from my experience, I, I see that clients can the perception of an organization can be changed in just a simple registration process. And if it's very um, cumbersome, their interpretation of the business or their perception of the business can be that this is going to be um, a, a not the, the most seamless journey that they could be. So, with that in mind, what types of sign on? or registration experiences, or do you think are the main culprits for most of your abandonment of these type of projects, i.e., could it be ease of use? Could it be the security, though you would hope that that's embedded uh, from the start? Could it be the speed, or could it just be the number of clicks? We know we have to do certain things for the regulators. We know we have to be compliance, et cetera. But how do you make that as easy as possible, and how do you make that process and that journey? I'm going to go to you, Slav, on that, if I may. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, before I actually comment on, on your question, John, just maybe just a, a little bit mention about the, because there was a lot of points on the pre good points on the previous. One thing, uh, I have a two more observation if I may just add is, um, one is that, um, you know, those all regulations and compliance and all the security things that we sometimes thinking that, why do we all need that? Well, um, because they're building trust, right? Trust mm -hmm. between the bank and, and, and the customer. And so why the fintechs are not successful at the large scale? Why are the big banks are still there? Because there's no trust. Would you move all your funds to some fintech company at this <laughs> stage? Probably not, <laughs> right? So, so that's one. And second one is that the, the definitely a strong <clears throat> trend, I would say, on the market we observe is that a number of banks globally, they becoming an identity provider. Right, so as to the national services or to the other firms, or so it's actually a, a good business. It can be a good business revenue stream business for the banks as well. Right, so that's that's two things I, I like to mention on that. When it's coming on the abandonment, I, I would say you know, um, I, we don't really see like it's really hard to, uh, to 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 measure that from from that angle, uh, but. I would say the, the one thing uh, I like to mention is that definitely the password kind of is behind us. Um, if, if you look about the, like for example, the mobile application, right? Um, so which, which application requires you to log in each time? It's probably your bank, it's your medical records and some security app, that's it, right? 
So I believe there is this, this big transformation that is happening in the back where, where you know, kind of uh, your face, your biometric, like all the biometrics and, and MFA will become a new norm and new standard in the, in the in the identity world. And, you know, typing your 19 characters long password is probably a, something very legacy. Uh, uh, only 19, <laughs> Slav, gosh. <laughs> or, three, or three characters from that 19 character password. Yeah. <laughs> I tell you, one of the things that's interesting, I've, I've, I've just got uh, my new phone arrived this morning, the new iPhone uh, 12, and it means I've got to put all my banking apps in it and everything else again. So I've got to go through that journey on about seven or, or eight different apps today. But one thing I've noticed with the iPhone and the face recognition, it doesn't work with a mask. Yeah, um, a lot of times I've been in the shop and I've needed to um, pay and I've had to quickly go like that. So I think that's something that Apple might want to work on in the future. I don't know. Uh, and invent that. Well, the, the they're, bringing, they're bringing this back. The fingerprint's coming back. <laughs> it is. It is. Well, I have Android and, and Apple, so um, I, I get that with the Android. Um, Duncan, do you want to come in on this as well? And I know some brilliant points, by the way, from, from, from you, Slav, and I think uh, it's a lot of food for thought. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, do, I just want to come in on what Slav said um, around the sort of multi-factor authentication piece. I think and and slash probably wearing a passwords a dead t-shirt i guess because because that's what we're really saying isn't it and I, i've probably got a hat somewhere under the desk that says you know passwords are dead because they are you know it's it, it's a very old-fashioned we've been using you know passwords what 30 years we're making them much more you know complex we're, we're, we're requiring people to do much more customers are getting very frustrated i'm sorry it's 12 it's 16 characters you know we kind of laugh about it um you know people aren't generally sort of trained to to do passwords that are memorable it gets silly they share them across their platforms you, you talked about um medical records or or banking you know most users are going to use the same password because it's easy to remember across uh, you know those so you, you go to the dark web and, and i look at you know what's what's john's credit card or personal details or passwords you know uh, worth this week and you can see the value of some of that stuff uh, going up and down almost like the stock market so it, it, you know we have to assume that actually in many cases passwords have already been compromised that piece you know people already use so what is the other multi-factor that we think is useful as you say um you know apple are very clever about using you know relatively basic forms of multi-factor whether it's fingerprints and as you say face recognition but actually people you know why is apple one of the biggest brands in the world it's because they make their their experiences very easy for the customer and again you know apple aren't quite a disruptor anymore because they've been around for such a long time but it's that sort of mindset of what if the customer first but customer first that's also you know safe and secure so i think to slab's point if we take away passwords i think that's where we need to probably start what other ways can we have that people can as you say authenticate their identity you know they get a, a common experience across you know a number of applications all that sort of good stuff really i think um a couple of uh, quotes come to me at the moment i think uh, trust that verify i think Ronald reagan quoted uh, with mikhail gorbachev and it's certainly something that we are looking to incorporate where passwords yes are dead but you start looking at other ways that you can um, use identifiers like temporal measurements, um, pattern analysis. I'm going to mention AI. We haven't mentioned it yet. But um, there are men, many, many. Um, I'm really glad you them. haven't mentioned AI, actually, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's the common word. It's the, it's the buzzword it of the day, isn't it, AI? So I'm really, yeah, thank you, John. I think we have to bring it in there at some point. We do, we do, we do. Yeah. Yeah. Can someone say blockchain quickly? Oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to do it. I was, I was waiting for that to the end. Sorry. <laughs> well, you've, you've got a list of words of you, Rob. <laughs> I do. I yeah. In Scrabble at the moment, and we're trying yeah. to work them in. I think, I, I think we are in a, in a, 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 there is certainly a change in the air. I think when we come out of lockdown, whenever we come out of lockdown, I think we're going to be analysing what works, what doesn't work. But I think what what is absolutely fundamental is that it needs to be easy. It needs to be straightforward for our clients. And with that in mind, um, it brings me on to, to sort of looking at things like um, contactless experiences. So are you, as, uh, uh, as, as leaders in your organization, are you prioritizing contactless experiences um, when in-person interactions are pretty much are necessary and what you're doing to, to work around this? And will this actually change the way that we do business in the future? And, and I think 
that and I'm 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 certainly and our organization is certainly working towards this. We want that experience to be um easier for our for our clients. Um Slab, do you want to come in on this? I will come back to you again, Rob, on this. Yeah, absolutely. Um I would say um so, so number one, uh ING I think done a uh an amazing job but i can say that because it was before me so <laughs> but basically you know 80 like literally looking 85 percent of all the operational processes that the bank has is already fully digital there's no human intervention which is it's amazing basically it's still there that you know 15 percent, and this 15 percent it's actually related to the all the legal compliance things that needs to happen so for example in certain markets we have the regulation where you open the account, it can be fully digitalized, so a couple of clicks and you're done. Uh, but then let's say you want to mortgage. And in order to have the mortgage, you're doing your credit scoring, you do the you know background screening, you know, or collecting all the documentation, etc. It's all done automatically. But then unfortunately, to sign off the contract to, to take all that money from the bank and uh, and to use it for the for all the good purposes, you have to go to the branch and sign it off, right? Is it legacy? Yes, it's legacy. Is it going to be changed? Probably yes. It will take time. Yes, it will take time, right? But COVID, what COVID showed us is the is the amazing opportunity from my, like despite all the tragedy mm -hmm. behind COVID, obviously. But the, the the things that we as technologists fight for a number of years to make sure that it's happening, it's actually happening now. It's accelerated massively, right? And that's a good thing. Um, so, so I would say that that's that definitely one of the things. I think the focus is, uh, I would say, is also on the self-service. So you don't really need people to do the stuff for you. You actually can do yourself uh, in a simple way. That's the key because it's a customer experience method because if you have to spend hours to find it out, of course, you will pick up the phone and call the bank, right? That's, 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 that's not the way to organize everything uh, across the financial products and, and, uh, and, and services. Um, lastly, maybe minor thing, you know, COVID definitely changed one thing from, from my perspective. Uh, again, Agile is, uh, is, 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 is you know, probably another buzzword, but uh, the, the, the thing that we have to change a little bit in the Agile manifesto is that, you know, it's assumed that the squad works together very closely and being in the one office, they had that opportunity. Now it's different, right? And not many companies in the past actually were working regularly from remotely. Now they have to. Uh, but moreover, those who are working in Agile, they have to also adjust with the management practices. And that's not easy because we are dealing with people, different people, different mentalities, different behaviors. Uh, and that's that's important to make sure this is happening. So the product side and delivering to the customer is not, not impacted, not easy. But I strongly believe we, we, we never come back to the level of, you know, sitting in the big corporate offices um, as a couple of thousands of people in one building. Uh, I think this will change. And probably I, I, the most I'm very... I was going to say, Slav, a lot of chief execs will probably agree with you. Yeah, that, you know, if they're looking at the foot space and thinking, why did I pay for all of that space when everybody can be distributed at home? I think you're entirely right, yeah. Yeah. And then I think the, the last point I would mention, which I'm probably the most uh, happy taking care about our climate and nature, is that how many prints out suddenly disappeared. I look you on, on the bank as a real example, 95% of all the printouts that we had to do in the past is gone. No one is printing. Yeah. I can uh, completely concur with this because I ran a report yesterday to look at the, um, the pattern of printing over the past two years what's happened this year uh it's it's interesting where we've uh, probably saved the rainforest um the amount of amazon boxes i've had here and it's interesting and I'm, I'm gonna bring you in a minute uh, duncan on this but from my experience it's been previously uh, uh there's been an age gap it's been a um depending on the age of the client how receptive they are to using portals and what they perceive as and they still see it as, as a as a, um, a dark art biometrics and, and that someone can steal the information from them but what lockdown has achieved it's it's they've had to use technology and we're talking the 65 70 pluses if they want to keep in communication with their families guess what they've had to use zoom 
They've had to use smartphones. They've had to work with technology. And they've had to use and see the benefits of it. And I think they are now seeing the benefits. And we need to make sure that when we go back, that we realize that and we, we understand where, where that's worked and where it hasn't. And I think that's really interesting for us. And it's certainly we're looking at every single process and to see how we can make it as easy as possible. Duncan, do you want to come in with your views on that as well? Yeah, I think I think that I agree exactly with with everything that's been said. It's forcing a change, isn't it? it, it I mean, I do love the paper example. Um, you know, uh, we were supposed to be a paperless technology, weren't we? Sort of twenty, thirty years ago, when you know computers first came in, and actually, you know, working in financial services, I don't. I think it got worse, not not any better, because of as you say, the the the. I guess it was the perception that we all, and we know what it's like, we it was certainly financial services and very heavily regulated industries, having that piece of paper, archiving it in a box, it goes into the archive storage, you know, and it stays there for 20 years, and, and then they go, Slav, can, can you now get it out for me 25 years later? And you're like, great, where, where did that go? Um, you know, the, the kind of move, I mean, Darius, you know, uh, the, the government sort of approach of perhaps the next sort of last 10 years is is digital first. I think, I think we, you know, we've got to face facts that, We've got to move towards a more digital economy. This information, you know, has to be available when people want it. And even sort of GDPR reflects that, you know, it's got to be, we've always got confidentiality, integrity, availability. The availability is really important as is the ensuring, you know, the confidentiality and integrity of the data is there, you know, when we need it. And, and talking about sort of multi-factor, you're right, biometrics is always a kind of list of, uh, and there's lots of really boring academic PhD reports on this stuff, but interesting to, to people like me is to what level of acceptance do people, um, you know, accept certain types of biometrics, you know, but fingerprinting, people, most people say that's that's not a problem. But if you stood them in front of a machine and said, I'm going to blow in your eye and do a, you know, James Bond sort of retina scan, um, and most people would probably balk at that and say, no, thank you. So I think it's finding that balance between what we're sort of comfortable accepting as you say is that sort of multi-factor piece but also you know as you say john that there is a there is a sea change and i think that's also our opportunity to to sort of change behaviors to to that sort of natural inertia that we have sometimes as as a human species just to say look things are different and and let's not be afraid of the future here are the sorts of things that we could be doing instead of passwords and printing and all that sort of old-fashioned stuff so yeah i think it's a real sort of you know change you know, turning that tanker. I think we've got to be supported, though, by by the regulators. They've got to accept that we want this. Yeah, they absolutely, absolutely. But I mean, you know, my view is also we we do, you know, in the nicest way, we have to educate regulators. You know, because regulators, you know, don't always, you know, they, they can't know the subject matter as as everybody would do, you know, necessarily here. So it, part of my job actually is to give a lot back to regulators. And there's at least two of them. You know, in America, I had to, we had to deal with five of them. You know, they've got a sort of conglomerate of regulators in America. And we were global payments I used to work for. They were a payment card, uh, they're, you know, backbone, four billion dollar sort of company and the, the regulation was almost sort of overwhelming but that that's kind of what you did but i agree you, you have to have the regulators i mean in most instances they're saying you've got to have the the appropriate operational te technical controls um you you hope they wouldn't be too prescriptive there are occasions perhaps when they are and that's when you know the industry has to turn around and say but but we're, we this is how we achieve what you're asking us to do Thing is, though, uh, uh, Duncan, I don't know if the others have experienced this. The regulators never tell you exactly what to do; they just give you a vague idea. Uh, there is some, there's some horrible grey areas, and you probably spend a little bit more time just working out what it was they meant in the first place. Um, so, yeah, and it's not to bash the regulators, but sometimes, you know, sometimes if you don't know the area, right? I mean, I wouldn't ask about, I wouldn't be an actuarial. I would probably ask questions, you know, of people, but I would, I'd be careful to you know, pose them in such a way to say, I don't really know what you do. Can you, can you, can you just tell us what you do? And then we'll also do some, you know, further testing work as, as an auditor would. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I think to, just to put on, to, uh, to add to that as well. And, and when you go back to these stuffy papers in PhDs, I'll let you read some yeah. of mine. That yeah. Okay. Will, uh, good. Yeah. Yeah. I, read, I love all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've published a few. So um, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I read, I read all that. Absolutely. It's, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll send you some details. Um, Rob, do you want to add to that, please, on the conversation? 
Yeah, sure. So, I mean, a couple of really interesting things. I mean, I almost wanted to go go right back to what what, what feels like an hour ago, <laughs> um, around um, you know the, the kind of experiences that tend to that tend to increase friction for users. I think, I mean, quite naturally, given the, uh, the the sort of the makeup of the panel today, we've been talking quite a lot around sort of financial services and banking, with a sort of a laser focus on on that particular industry. Um, and of course, it's an industry that is that is more highly regulated and has you know very strict requirements around things like you know sort of KYC and anti money laundering and, and all the rest of all the rest of that sort of stuff. Um, but I think that when it comes to establishing uh, digital identities for for individuals more more broadly uh, across across the piece, it feels to me as though we're a little bit addicted to collecting personal data. Um, and it feels to me that it's almost a default to say, look, at the point that the user registers, let's collect every single piece of data we can from them, just in case there's a chance we might need it later on. And that has been shown to be the, the one single point of, of friction that tends to impact drop off more than anything else. I mean, I'm not talking about signing up to access a bank account. I think everybody accepts that there's going to be friction involved in that. And and as, as Slava said, there's, there's trust that's being established in that process you don't actually want a bank account that's going to let you into it without actually proving who you are to some extent. But it's completely different if you're signing up to buy something from an e-commerce site, right? Why is it that you actually need to go through this really complex um, this really complex process? So so certainly I think that the, um, and, and the GDPR again is, is kind of driving us towards this. And it's quite interesting just listening to, uh, again, just sort of fast forwarding a little bit to talk about compliance. And and some of the things that we that we need to comply with, and how sometimes there can almost be these 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 contradictory aims of the different things that we need to comply with. GDPR basically saying to you, look, let's let's move away from this process of just hoarding as much data as we can about every individual, and making as many copies of it as we like, and sharing it as widely as we like, and and not being clear about what we're using it for, um, you know, and and really trying to 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 think and be judicious about what data we actually need. Uh, from the individuals that we that we're doing business with, uh, so that we can make sure that we can we can protect it appropriately, um, and then of course moving on to you know the requirement to do things like K, you know KYC and AML of course, which is kind of you know contrary to that. But but again, things need to be um, you know appropriate to the purpose and to the industry that we're working in. So um, there are obviously examples uh, within financial services of, of organisations, and these are. Challenges, fintechs, sure. Some of them are banks. Um, you know, the, the line between fintech and bank can blur sometimes. Uh, who offer, you know, really straightforward and seamless processes of signing up for accounts. Now, let's be honest about it. Those organisations aren't offering the complex things like mortgages and loans, right? They're offering current accounts. You know, and and again, uh, to Slav's point, it's like just about everybody has probably got two or three of these bank accounts, you know, which they access through their phone how many people actually get their salary paid into one of those bank accounts it's it's a, it's a much lower number so it's, it's an interesting interesting thing there yes i <laughs> don't can say something because me, I, do, I do want to talk i do want to talk about your yeah. your point as well but but yeah, yeah. please <laughs> no no it's fine i was going to say that's true and i think you know it, 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 it's comfort level i you entirely agree and, and um sorry we, we i am going on a bit about financial services because you, you, when you spend a bit too long in financial service you become financial services don't you? um you know and if i give a slightly different example you know global payments was um you know, it was a car. It was an acquirer. So it's, it's, you know, I've been in the sort of middle between the customer and the bank, actually, and that was that's quite um, that's quite an interesting process because we are you, your partner as a bank. You know, we're trying to offer services. We were trying to offer services that we, you know, a fast forward were using your Apple Watch to go and pay for something, do do all this sort of funky stuff. Um, we've got to uh, to Slav's point, which is a really good one. I think we keep coming back to is get that level of trust whatever it is that we're trying to do and as you said there's a different there's a different kind of acceptance as you say for your maybe for your bank details and your sort of medical details but even for the sort of bank stuff people are starting to move towards an acceptance actually do you know i'm going to go contactless for for 30 pounds mm -hmm. actually you know risk wise i mean 
uh, you know, I don't know, maybe five, ten years ago, people would have said five pounds. You know, is that is that sort of risk appetite changing slightly? I'm just sort of broadly looking at the market and thinking. I think I think that's true, Rob. I think you know, as our sort of appetites change, and actually, I think John, we probably talked generational, didn't we? Um, you know, as I'm I'm now in my sort of early forties, I kind of look back and think um, there, there's a whole generation of people who are used to technology. They've got hands on technology. They want technology to be smart, fast, secure in their hands. They're going to be using, sorry to throw names in here, the Monzos, the Starlings, you know, the sort of disruptor type banks. They're just going to expect, yeah. you know, this stuff. And it, as you say, at my age, not many people would be using one of those to to get their salary, you know, put into. Um, and, but but I guess early adopters, my age maybe, but maybe uh, younger generations, um, probably everybody will just kind of get used to that interaction and go, do you know what I've got? As John said, you, you've got face recognition or you've got other factors. That's good enough for me. You know, risk wise, my appetite's not quite the same. Therefore, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. So I think it's it's got to, you know, to your point, it's got to reach a sort of plethora of people and their risk appetites in terms of what, you know, what they're sort of happy to do. If I, if I, if you don't mind, if I just pop mm-hmm. in again, Duncan, and say two things to that, and I think that that you, you, you're spot on there. The thing that is challenging, and we're, we're seeing this in a lot of industries, right? The thing that is challenging for the more traditional organisations and the more traditional players is that those disruptors are setting the bar in terms of customer experience. Mm-hmm. They yeah. are creating the expectation of what customer experience is going to be like. And to be honest, they probably. You know, the, the consumers, and again, you know, at, at the risk of, you know, using a stereotype, I mean, the younger consumers that, that are expecting that kind of thing, they probably don't really care too much about the fact that, you know, you've got legacy backend infrastructure that you need to deal with and you need to integrate with, whereas the, the startup that's 10 minutes old doesn't. You know, it's kind of like, yeah, hey, yeah, we want yeah. it to be as easy as Monzo, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Now, yeah, yeah. But now the thing to me that's interesting, it's actually the, the point I was, you know, to, to your Previous point, <laughs> it's like keeping track of a multi-thread conversation here. Um, but your point around regulators, what they ask for, and and how to almost almost educate them. I mean, we've done a lot of work with um, you know with, with banks uh, and and fintechs around um, you know a PSD two, for instance, strong customer authentication, um, and that was a that was a really interesting example of a you know regulatory technical standard a. a piece of compliance legislation that came out that was very specific about the kind of things that had to happen, but had no yeah. no details whatsoever as to how they were to be done. And yeah. the thing that I found that was really interesting about that was almost the same people who were the disruptors, who were the innovators, who were the startups, came up with ways to you know, achieve compliance with that RTS without having to destroy the customer experience experience in the process. So yeah. when the RTS says something about, uh, you know, in wording that frankly seems to come out of the 1970s around how you need to do multi-factor authentication, there were some organizations that interpreted that in a way that was mobile native, you know, that involved biometrics from the start that didn't incorporate lots of, of redirects and friction and stuff like that whereas you know others did and it's kind of interesting because it's like in a way to me it's like saying that compliance in and of itself has to equal a poor customer experience it to me is not is is not completely on the mark yeah i I totally agree with that yeah yeah Right, guys, we've got we've been talking and it's just seemed I'm going to bring you in a minute love um for uh, 50 minutes now i just want to prompt anybody with questions we are, we are approaching, a, we've got a couple more left, but I really want to bring in the audience here because you've got a wealth of knowledge here and you guys, um, will, I'm happy to, I'm sure you'll be happy to, to discuss that with them. So um, I'm going to bring you into Slav. I know you want to say something now, but um, uh, I'm just looking for some questions to come in from the audience. So uh, Slav, do you want anything to add to this from, from the conversation? I'm going to add a couple of bits in as well um, after. No, I think a lot of us said, I agree that the, uh, you know, definitely the risk appetite is keep changing. Agree completely. I think banks have to do a lot to not lose clients. Um, the world will change very fast if, if the banks will not do anything on that space. Agree. Mm. Um, and to be fair, they, they do, 
is it enough? I don't know. I mean, I'm like hard to predict anyway, but, <clears throat> but I would say, you know, the different banks, they're trying different methods, either they part, you know, partnership with, with FinTech or maybe they setting up the FinTechs themselves, hmm. like many examples, uh, or, you know, or, uh, or kind of uh, backing up from the funding perspective only different different methods i think this this trend will definitely strongly continue um yeah i think the, so, the um, were very well said with that in mind i mean we're looking at uh, what we're looking at for maybe the next 12 24 months What's on your agenda? What do you think is going to be the big thing? And where do you think we're working towards over that period? What's the what's the bigger picture, the priority that we should be looking at? And what you feel is going to go? Now, we know we're going to hopefully come out of uh, lockdown next year, whatever that, whatever the new normal will be, whatever that may be. Um, from our perspective, we're looking at what clients want and what they expect. And I think this is going to be a new world. And I think we need to, um, it will be the ones that bring that to market and that the experience of the clients are just seamless it's easy i don't want all this hassle anymore uh and i think this is coming from working from home not having to take the train they want the easy life they've had so what do you think is going to happen the next 20 12 20 if you had a crystal ball um what do you think is going to happen over the next um one to two years because budgets and planning uh, slav, I'll back to you. slav sorry i had a connection issue for five seconds um thank you uh, i think you know the uh uh rob mentioned the psd2 um and this was fascinating because you know uh when this was kind of branded uh a lot of happened right a lot of people think like this will be cool you know the the world will change you know the different <laughs> things happen. and then a lot of banks went with implementation what happened nothing yeah. What's the percentage of people using PSD2 aggregator between the accounts, between the banks? 1% maybe, right? So it's it's very hard to predict, I would say. That, that's number one. But if obviously I will have a, a crystal ball, I would say definitely the e-commerce will, e will boom as it's booming now. The, um, the education services and the banking services and the Kind of sectors that were uh, kind of semi-traditional uh, still semi-traditional will continue to be digitalized uh, and i actually we see that actually in the data of what those uh, companies are doing right now in order to either to survive or actually prepare for the future um, so, so so that will continue definitely the uh, remote working so any solutions that the, the companies the sectors actually is being created now that we see that is formulating around this remote work and flexible working and you know kind of hr practices of how to do it effectively will definitely continue and it's something towards actually to invest um for me it will be interesting is it uh, is the COVID created enough time to to make sure that the people uh, will not come back to the old uh, kind of behaviors it will be already a new behavior created so for example like you don't work from nine five in the office you actually have a you know split and you organize your life in the way that you can actually do that effectively and you like it right not everyone like it let's face it right because what happened uh, from a kind of statistics perspective is that short term we've seen the productivity increase working from home and you know companies working from home but is the long-term trend is it a trend i don't know i mean to some extent people it, it's hard to imagine how you innovate for example working from home right With, without your colleague without diversity without you know uh, ability to meet together and just exchange the uh, ideas uh, so so technology is perfect but it's not perfect in every single case uh, and i think you know it will be difficult to some extent to uh, predict what was going to happen on this on this but i think on the scale level i think the, the, this is the trend where, where we're going like um in the banking sector the big things happening i think you know definitely you mentioned uh, john uh, ai uh, that that will definitely continue and even in identity space is actually interesting because once you eliminate this uh, nice all these passwords we hated uh, 
you know, we already, we, some of the banks are already, including ING actually, is uh, deploying the AI kind of engine who's checking your behaviors, like how, how fast you're typing your something, you know, how you s swipe your screens or something like that, right? So, so it's, a, it's a very powerful method already to authenticate uh, your, your customer, make sure that, you know, uh, whatever you do on this account, you know, you are the right person to do that. So uh, regulations, in terms of regulation, I strongly believe that uh, the, the education of regulators is, is required, and but also the regulators will have a much uh, slightly la lighter approach to the, to the traditional regulations. So they will allow us to do the more digital space, um, more digital solution in that space. And, um, and yeah, that's, that's, I think that's the key. Um, I'm, I'm very curious actually what's going to happen with the VR solutions because uh, there is quite a lot of companies who now start offering you, you know, glasses where you can actually have a full like room experience uh, with 3D, which is which is pretty cool actually. Um, although you know your your network capability or your your broadband, it really depends on 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 the location unfortunately and but and you know telcos you know we were saying you know probably five ten years ago that telcos is a dying business because what they're going to do they will just provide a cable right and nowadays actually that cable becomes very very important mm. item yeah. it's your lifeline so, <laughs> <exactly>. <laughs> probably more, more, more than the hs2 but that's a that's another for another day <laughs> um, uh, duncan would you like to add on there with your crystal ball the next 12 to 20 Oh. Yeah, I mean, you know, if I was to be specific, you know, it, it, many companies are are going to go through the challenges of, you know, merging and unmerging and getting sold. And what does that customer experience look like when when that happens? I think just to Slav's point, how do, how do you integrate this? You know, we um, we never thought, as you say, copper wire or fiber wire would would be so important. You know, the reality is. Uh, we've now got to meet virtually. There's got to be better capabilities. I think, um, you know, I think certain companies, um, pretend I didn't say Microsoft as a brand, you know, have probably have probably stormed it, you know, where historically you you probably thought other businesses might might sort of do that. So there's there's lots of ways in which companies I think are going to sort of push push technology. I think security has got to be an identity, you know, an access management has got to be more seamless. It's got to, we're used to that sort of frictionless approach um, as we sort of work from home. And I think, I think John and Rob, you made the sort of point at the start of the call that um, people have had the taste of that. And, and I would add, well, how, how do you put the lid back on? We're now going to reintroduce all of these really clunky, um, really horrible to use, you know, 85 characters, as Slav said, 16 character passwords or something. You know, we've got to think of new ways as as the as the disruptors do, um, you know, and to remind everybody knows this, but MFA, there's lots of things, you know, it's something you have, something you are, um, you know, it, all that sort of good stuff that I, we've seen bits of, you know, we've seen kind of biometrics sort of here and there i think there's got to be a, a, a bigger push and there will be a bigger push i think to to using more more of that sort of technology at home using more of that technology for the customer experience um that's surely got to be the way forward i think i agree now we've got a couple of questions coming in and, I, and i'll bring you back in as well rob on this but um one one question that i think is quite uh, quite interesting do you see more joint ventures in terms of companies pushing these partnerships and seamless integration between each other, better end user experiences and reducing project costs, sharing risk. Um, um, Slav? I have a very simple on, on that one. It's it's a quote uh, by Mr. Drucker, probably the most, I mean, you know, you know, the gentleman, right? So he said that, you know, the, in today's world, uh, the companies who win is not about who provide the perfect product is those who provide the fastest one and mm -hmm. you know historically the companies were developing their products and to end themselves now is you part of ecosystem you're using different blocks blocks and you kind of integrate all of the things and if you do it well then you win on the market so that would be my answer i heard it i heard a good quote uh, earlier this week right is that if you're not embarrassed by the uh, by, by the, the quality of of your mvp it means you launched too late <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> yes, here's my minimum viable product. Um, and, I'm and, not I mean, and I yeah. do mean minimum. <laughs> minimum <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I meant minimum when I said minimum. Yeah. Really like yeah. 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 Do you want to comment on that? Do you, do you think that joint ventures is, is um, sharing the uh, risk? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah I, absolutely. I mean, um, uh, you know, I, I had a, another call today, which was exactly that, you know, talking to people, um, vendors, you know, who are in the, who are in the sort of market. And it was quite obvious that, uh, as Slav says, you, you've got a dashboard now. Uh, frankly, why wouldn't you? Uh, you've got a kind of smorgasbord of uh, of um, companies working together with each other to give you, if I'm the customer, right, being purely selfish, um, everything you could want. You know, you can sort of pick and choose those services. You can you can have this bit, that bit. I think traditionally, you know, as an organisation, we would have we would we would have said well this is a service you're getting and that's that you know i think organizations also have to talk about a range of services that we deliver in conjunction with other providers and you know we, we've done it before we've um we provide a bit of service we out we allow other people to go and brand it you know and and here's the service you know they're they're a building society we're an insurer but actually you can do all that if you want your pet insurance you know we, we funny enough you get a redirect from a very well-known supermarket or supermarkets and um and, and funnily enough we'll come and do the sort of pet piece as well so here's your kind of one-stop shop but but we i suppose as customers we don't really mind where it comes from you know i think as, as i was probably saying you, you 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 just want to know that it, as you say it's an mvp um it looks relatively nice you, you know you know and 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 all those pieces work for you so yeah agree with that um rob do you want to add anything to that yeah, I think I think that's I think that's exactly right. And I mean, you know, maybe to to sort of bring it back to to my sort of favorite sort of pet subject here, right? Um, you know, identity, federated identity, is 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 one of the key enablers to to making that sort of thing work and making it seamless for the customer. Now, if I, you know, in the, in this kind of scenario, you know, if I'm starting off with a a, a a supermarket chain and I'm sort of clicking through to to get to get pet experience. Uh, pet insurance, sorry, <laughs> pet experience is completely different thing. Um, you know, I um, yeah, that's a different uh, session. Probably that's a different, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my, my dog, yeah. my dog's interaction with his uh, his insurance provider. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, I'm just amazed that my dog hasn't barked through the session, so he's probably saving it all for like right at the end. But yeah, yeah, um, yeah me too. <laughs> me too. But 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 certainly, I mean, you know, for 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 me as a consumer, you know, I would expect that if I have some sort of a relationship with it, with that supermarket and, and a you know a, a loyalty program or some form of identity established there, when I click through to to buy pet insurance, I mean, you know, I want what is known about me, at least the relevant bits of what is known about me, yeah. to actually go along with that process, so that when I inevitably do have to sign up for that insurance, at least I'm not having to type in absolutely everything again and yeah. set up a, a new account. So, yeah. so yeah, I think, I think that's, that's definitely a thing, but yeah, the spirit, the, 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 the kind of the way that, that the world seems to be working today is far more about a spirit of collaboration in terms of picking and choosing the bits and pieces that you need. I mean, the move towards like SaaS services, the move towards API delivery of everything has made this kind yeah. of inevitable. Yeah. You don't, you don't build, the commodity stuff you don't even build the specialist stuff that's not your specialist stuff you you, you just consume that you yeah. partner for that i think that's sharing the risk sharing the cost and i think at the end of the day you can concentrate on what your organization does best and i think this has been proven again and again and certainly from our perspective the organization is that human touch at the end of it yes they want to do all the laborious things that need to be automated and all the things they don't like doing make that easy so the experience is actually the bit that separates you from your competition. Just on that, I mean, John, just one, one point on that. And I mean, obviously this goes without saying, right? But I mean, the one the one risk that you can't share is is reputational risk to, to your brand. Um, and and this, this is kind of like the, the counter or the caveat to this, right? Is that, you know, you've got to make sure that when you're establishing these partnerships, you're doing it on the basis of, uh, you know, let's say a shared philosophy in terms of, customer trust in terms of of what acceptable security is because you know if you somebody starts a process with you and your brand is kind of all over it and then a third party ends up getting involved and there ends up being some sort of a compromise there well you know you, you're yeah, going to uh, suffer the fallout uh, from that uh, rob that's a very good point i mean you know one of the biggest things that auditors look right across the board they open their big book mm -hmm. and it says mm -hmm. supply relationships doesn't it yeah, yeah. and um you know and, and the level of detail yeah. that auditors I mean, the two big areas I've noticed in the last five years is around identity and access management. 
the, the interest from regulators and auditors. Uh, and as you say, the relationship with your suppliers, which, um, you know, historically, you probably would not have done the level of due diligence we, we are now expected to do. Um, so I think I think we, we picked up here quite a few of those points because I think they're pertinent across the board. You know, it's not just financial services, but uh, auditors from from all the big audit firms are coming in, and they're they're the sort of first questions we get. You know, we tend tend to get asked. Yeah, there's a reason for that, and you, you look at what uh, and I know we're talking finance here and, and the FCA. It's what's been on their their radar. Yeah. I think yeah. highlight supplier chain, and yeah. in many organisations, it's the weakest link as well, and and it's the weakest element of that. Um, unless anybody else has got anything uh, more to add, there's another question coming, and I want to thank um, uh, Lawrence Tyson for this. Um, the impact of the remote working has pushed towards digitalization, but do you think there'll be a social pushback with flexible working where people will be want more physical interactions than before and maybe less digital processes? Now, that's an interesting concept. We all think we're people are going to want more, but are we going to push back? against the machine. Um, Slav? Uh, that, that's a little bit coming back what what I tried to say before. <clears throat> I think uh, flexible working will be used more mm. than used to be. Um, but obviously a large portion of the company still needs to do their job in terms of offering the a proper uh, collaboration tools and the whole workspace, I would say, experience, which should be unified across all the channels. Is uh, is that will replace human interactions? I don't believe, uh, simply because even on, on this call, right, if two or three people will start talking at the same time, we probably will not get an agreement. If uh, 10 people in the room will start talking at the same time, well, communication will be much better, right? So we know that it will be much faster, much more innovative, etc. So I think that's, you know, technology has its limitations and, you know, human beings are kind of, you know, we like being together. Maybe not always, but most, most of the time, yes, we want to be together. We want to socialize. We want to do the things together and... Uh, and uh, yeah, so I think human, physical interactions in the office will come back, but I don't believe to to the extent that it used to be before uh, before COVID, and for various reasons. It can be even simple, like you know, um, Duncan actually mentioned that the real estate executive will look and like and think like, why do I need this corporate office? Right. That, that that's a simple reason. But then, uh, <clears throat> but I think you know. The, the how we use real estate will massively change. Um, I don't believe that people will need a dedicated office, for example, or a dedicated desk. I think it will be fully flexible. Uh, I also believe that there will be more collaboration space rather than the desks, because you probably mm -hmm. will be coming to the office one or two days, you know, to 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 hang out with your, you know, um, with your colleagues and uh, agree all the things that needs to be done, and then come back to work to actually do this, right? So, yeah, I think that's 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 the way how how I see this going forward. And uh, for you, Duncan, we're, we're entering the last five minutes or so of, of the uh, of the session. So, um, Duncan, over to you. What, what would you say to that? I I, I think um, I think to the same point, really. I don't I don't think we should be surprised if there are still people. And I, you know, I I still I know conversations within my own department and and, um, and areas sometimes. Um, you know about the push to go back to the office. There is there is a there is a small number of people who who much prefer, you know, the way it was, uh, and to go into an office, have the interaction, as you say, with individuals. Uh, there is a slight irony of, uh, as Slav says, we used to sort of all sit around with a big television, didn't we? And you know, ten of us in a room, and and actually, really now that's ten of us in individual rooms with uh, slightly smaller screens. But in you know, most people, I think of it, of of generally sort of accepted that as a as the norm for now, I think people, uh, we shouldn't be surprised if they're, they're probably getting a little bit frustrated. I, I think generally, though, the, the sort of tipping point will mean that, that, that there'll still be more. And, and those businesses that want the best people, right, they will still have flexible working and they'll still have the, you know, the good technology that allows you to, to do that technical working, I think. I think you, someone said it's you can have too much of a good thing. I think uh, people have forgotten how bad the trains are. 
<laughs> I've not yeah. forgotten how bad the trains are. <laughs> but no, no, you're right. You're right. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's very true. Yeah, we sort of forget in some of those elements. Or maybe we're looking back with rose tinted spectacles slightly until we get back on that train, John, that cost you, you know, eight thousand pounds a a month, sort of thing. It's it's, and we suddenly look at our wallet and go, oh, that's where that's where it went. So, I think it swings around about. So we shouldn't be surprised if 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 some people are missing that and others aren't. The one app I'm not missing is Trainline to see when my train. Yes, yeah. The one thing I'm not missing. Uh, just, just to look at it and go cancel, 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 cancel. And then you yeah. look around and say pub, 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 pub. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Rob, uh, I'm going to give you the final word here um, on what you've heard so far, and there's any uh, pieces of wisdom that you want to relay. Oh, cheers! Thanks, John. That's a that's quite a quite a tough ask, I think. Um, it's interesting. I mean, the one thing. The one thing I have learned, um, and this goes directly to that previous question, people are very hard to predict. Um, and often they'll do things that you that you don't expect them to do. I do expect there to be a backlash when restrictions are finally lifted. And I, I expect people will overcompensate and will try to spend as much time. I wouldn't necessarily say in the office. I would say they'll go to the office to spend as much time as they can in the pub afterwards, because I think there's going to be generally a, an air of celebration once we do manage to get kind of kind of let out of our homes. But I, I don't think the the genie can be put back in the bottle on, on this. I, I'm sure some of us, you know, those of us who have been getting used to home working for you know for a long time, or at least have been doing it for a long time, um, sort of know how to strike that balance between what are the kind of things that we need to do in an office and where that collaboration is is useful, the in-person collaboration. And what are the kind of things where we can be more productive at home? And and you know, I, I welcome a situation where where everybody has the ability to to sort of structure their lives and balance their lives in that way. Because I think it's 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 healthier overall. Um, to maybe sum up, you know, the the whole discussion so far. And and, and John, again, thank you very much to to yourself and to and to Duncan and to Slav for uh, for participating today. Um, you know, I think it's 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 really critical for us to um you know to, to be able to start meeting our customers where they are to start to deliver the kinds of experiences that they're expecting to to cut down on that friction and to find innovative ways to do that that particularly in highly regulated industries uh, such as financial services don't cause us to to fall foul of, of the regulator um but i see it's an area where there's a lot of room for for innovation um you know when when we look at the way that a lot of companies are doing customer identity and access management at the moment, it doesn't feel as though anybody's really determined to innovate much and sort of push the envelope. They're, they're going back to what we've always been doing. Need an account, sign up, give us all your information, log in with a password. Passwords are dead, right? <laughs> this is this is the thing. I'm glad to hear everybody say it. We all know that they're dead. We've just, we've just got to make it so, and we've just got to make the investments in a lot of the cases, it's not that the technology isn't there. It's that we need to bring our customers along on that journey to get them to to accept those alternatives. And once they do, they'll generally be a lot happier. So as, as is my wont, I wandered all around that question and didn't give a very succinct summary. <laughs> but I think it's been a great a great conversation and I've really enjoyed it myself. Right. And um, uh, I want to thank you, Rob, very much. Um, I think it's the wisdom that really, Duncan uh, and Slav, you've been absolutely brilliant. I want to leave you with one um, one thought from me, and we've talked about the future and the new norm. Um, I'm going to quote Winston Churchill, if I may, at the end, um, who was talking about planning for the future, and, and it's always wise to plan ahead. But sometimes it's more difficult to, to see more than you can see or plan more than you can see. And I think that's very true, even in this day. And to the next 12, 24 months, whatever it brings, it's been a really enjoyable um, chat with you guys, and thank you very much. And thank you to Ping um uh for sponsoring this with inspired media thank you fabulous thank you yes thank you very much everyone